Genesis chapter 18 is going to look at an episode from the life of Abraham, the man of faith. And Abraham lived a rather interesting life, a rather dramatic life. It would not be a stretch to say that if Netflix or HBO were to get their hands on the script, on the scriptural account of Abraham's life, that it wouldn't make for a very fascinating docu-series or mini-series. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at two episodes, if you will, from Abraham, the mini-series, back-to-back episodes. We're going to binge-watch both of these. And as we do, we're going to leave the commentary on. We're going to leave the commentary on to hit pause every once in a while and see what this story, this story from the Old Testament teaches us, what, what God's Word gave to us this scripture for as it applies to our lives and what it means to stand before God in focused prayer. Episode one, we're going to call just that, Standing Before God. And it's going to start with a flash forward, if you will. This is... Episode 1, Standing Before the Lord, but first, a bit from Exodus chapter 19. We read this. By the time Lot reached Zoar and the sun had risen over the land, then the Lord rained down burning sulfur on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Thus, he overthrew those cities and the entire plain, destroying all those living in the cities and also the vegetation in the land. Why begin this way? Why begin with a flash forward to a very dramatic scene, really the dramatic ending to these episodes in Abraham's life? Two reasons. The first is this. Abraham, in our lesson for from God's word this morning is, is going to make a prayer, is going to make an appeal to God about Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and number one, you, you already know how this lesson, this story ends. Sodom and Gomorrah get destroyed, and they get destroyed seemingly even in the face of Abraham's prayers and pleas. We're getting it out of the way because you know the ending, but, but number two, here's the other reason to start with this flash forward, to get this dramatic ending out of the way, if you will. It's because although this gets a lot of press, after all, for an audience, for a culture that's obsessed with dramatic endings, you know, God's judgment, sulfur, fire raining down from the heavens, it's easy to see why, well, this gets a lot of press, this gets a lot of attention. But this isn't the most dramatic part of the story. This isn't the focus of why God has included these episodes in his word. What comes before is the focus. Everything that leads up to this moment, what happened to get there, that's what God wants us to focus on. If this is the flash forward, how this episode begins, what would come next on the screen is a a flash that says 16 hours earlier, and then we read this. Genesis chapter 18, beginning at verse 16. When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down to see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. This is the word of God so far. It's brilliant writing, really, on the part of the Holy Spirit. 
He could have done another flashback at this point to show you everything that had led up to this moment. But instead, what the Holy Spirit does, he lets you in on the will, the mind of God, a conversation that the triune God is having with himself about the goings-on on earth. He says, am am I going to really hide this, what I'm about to do from Abraham? Abraham, the one that I have made a promise, a covenant to. And then this this is the really cool part where he does give us a little flashback. He tells us all about the promise, the covenant that he made with Abraham. You know what that promise was? It was that Abraham would have a son with Sarah, even in their old age. But the promise was greater than that. The promise was that all nations, all nations on earth will be blessed through Abraham. How could that be? It's because this was a promise of a savior, a savior to come through the line of Abraham that would save all people from their sin, that would rescue everybody, including Abraham, from their sin. This was the gospel that the Lord spoke to Abraham and it worked faith in Abraham's heart even as it carried out his very salvation. Bit of a flashback from the Holy Spirit. Let's ask this, why was the Lord even there with Abraham? Why was the Lord and two angels, the men, sitting with Abraham at his tent in the first place? Well, here's where we do need to do a flashback. Abraham got that promise from the Lord multiple times in multiple years before this moment. And yet Sarah and Abraham were increasing in age. They were getting old and they looked at one another and said, we can't even have children at this age in our life. How, how is it that the Lord is going to bless us with a child and the Savior is going to come from, from us? Sarah thought about it and it, it didn't add up. It didn't make any sense. It was, it was too unbelievable. It was, it was too unnatural. So Sarah said, you know what? I'm going to take matters into my own hands. It's going to be hard, but Abraham, here is my younger servant Egyptian maidservant, what, just sleep with her, have a child with her, and now maybe in that way, that's how the Lord's going to bring this about. What does, Moses, or what does Abraham say? No, Sarah, I can't mistrust the Lord and his promises. I can't take matters into my own hands, and I, I can't break the sixth commandment and sleep with someone who's not my wife. Now, Abraham doesn't say that. Sarah says to Abraham, why don't you sleep with my younger Egyptian maidservant? Abraham goes, okay, and does. That's why the Lord's here. The Lord's here because he needed to remind Abraham and Sarah of the promise. And that's the focus of this first episode, of this episode of standing before the Lord. It's that When we see great sin on full display, what does God do? Shame people in the face of it? No, when we see great sin on full display, what we see is that God comes to us. God comes to us to keep us focused on our standing before the Lord. On our standing before the Lord. And there I'm using that phrase figuratively, as in our status before the Lord. When there is great sin on display, what do you see your God do? He comes to you. He comes to Abraham and he reminds him of his status, his standing before the Lord. Abraham, you are the one to whom I gave this promise to. Sarah, what are you doing going out of your way to take matters into your own hand? I am the one who promised you that even in your own age, I will give you a son, and from that son will come a people who will give birth to your Savior. What do we see? What do we see in this first episode? We see really great sin from Abraham, from Sarah, but in the face of that, the Lord comes and reminds them of their standing before the Lord. He reminds them of his amazing grace and promises. Where does that leave Abraham standing? 
Well, I used it figuratively before that Abraham was reminded of his status, his standing before the Lord. But there Abraham is with the Lord physically standing before him, standing before him face to face. What an amazing example of God's grace. You see, Abraham was not perfect. No, 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 Go read chapters 15 and following of Genesis, and you'll see all of the ways that Abraham messed it up royally. I told you about just one way. And yet, there is God allowing Abraham to stand with him face to face. Why? Because when you see great sin on display, this is what your God does. He comes and he reminds his people of their standing before the Lord. He did that to Abraham, and he did it to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah as well. Yes, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah was very great. They had really, really great and grievous sin. Did the Lord know that already from heaven? Yes. Did the Lord need to come down to see if it was really as bad as he heard that it was? Did the omniscient, all-knowing God really need to do that? No. But what does God do in the face of great sin? He comes into sin. He comes into sin for Abraham and Sarah, for Sodom and Gomorrah, and he does it to remind people of their standing before the Lord, that he is a Lord who does not like evil, but comes into evil in order to rescue his people from evil. He did it for Abraham and Sarah. He did it for Sodom and Gomorrah. And he does it for you and me too. We read the words earlier from 1 Timothy chapter 2, that God our Savior wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. Here's where you and I were. You and I were peoples who were standing before before God, and we deserved it. We deserved all of it, all of his wrath, all of the fire from heaven to rain down on us. That's not what we got. Between us and God, we got the man, Christ Jesus, to go up on a cross and shield us from the flaming arrows of God's wrath that were to come for us. And he took them all so that you and I could stand there before him in prayer. We have now a mediator who isn't taking God's wrath, but who is taking all of the glory that was due him and having risen from the dead, stands there to remind his God that he has paid that penalty for our sins. He has paid that ransom to redeem you to your God. And that is what we see yet again. In the face of our great sins, in the face of all that we've done, what does God do? He comes into it. He comes into our evil and reminds you of your status, your standing before him, that you are his and he is yours. He has taken your sins away because Christ Jesus paid the penalty for sins and now you and I, in a full knowledge of that truth, get to approach God's throne room of grace. You and I, where does that leave us? It leaves us in the same place as Abraham. Yes, our our figurative standing before God is that our status is one that we are his and he is ours and we are completely redeemed, blood-bought children of God. And yet physically, spiritually, so to speak, we get to stand before our God and celebrate his supper. We get to stand before him, scripture tells us, already but not yet in his throne room of grace, talking to our God as though we were Abraham and Christ was standing here next to us. This is our focus of this first episode. It is that we see sin in its full great display in our hearts, in Abraham and Sarah, and we see it in Sodom and Gomorrah. But what we see most clearly is our standing before God. This is a sermon on focused prayer. It's a sermon on focused prayer that 
I'm going to get to it. We're going to talk about what we pray, how we pray, and who we pray focused prayers to. But before that, before we talked about the who, the what, and the how of focused prayers, we need to talk about the that. The that of focused prayers. That we can even pray. That we can even stand before God and talk to him, walk with him, and share our hearts with our God. That's the point of episode one. Episode one, standing before the Lord, leaves us with the scene of Sodom and Gomorrah. It takes us back to what happened to even have the Lord come down to Sodom and Gomorrah, but not just them, Abraham and Sarah as well. And it leaves us there. It leaves us standing before the Lord. And here in episode two, called Focus Prayer, where we're going to see just that. The greatest implications of getting to pray to God are what we get to pray, how we get to pray, and who we're praying to. Genesis chapter 18 continues, verse 22. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham approached God and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there were 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep it away and not spare the, pl the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? This is God's word. Oh, wait. The Lord said, if I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. This is the word of God. Think for a moment about the past episodes in Abraham's life. Think about all of the things that he could have prayed for. He could have prayed for a safe birth for his elderly wife. He could have prayed for maybe a sign that God you said that Sarah would have a child, but come on, things look a little unbelievable here. Could you give us a sign? He could have prayed for that. What happened with the Egyptian maidservant and Abraham and Sarah is, well, a child did come out of that, and it was kind of an awkward family situation. Abraham could have prayed about that, that God smoothed all that over. But he didn't. Abraham didn't pray about any of that for himself. What we see here in this focused prayer by Abraham, the man of faith, is a prayer for others. It's not even a prayer, hey, to save my nephew Lot and his family and, and all his relatives who live in the city. No, he prays for others, other people, but he does so, did you catch it? According to the character, according to the will of who God is. God, who wants all people to be saved, Abraham knows this and he says, will you, the judge of the world, really judge in this way? Will you really do something that is contrary to your nature, to your will? Will you really get rid of the righteous people when you want to save all the people? That's Abraham's prayer to God. And that's our first focus on this. What do we pray for? We're asking that question. Focus prayers, pray for what God wants for us and not just what we want from him. Think about your prayer life. Oftentimes prayers come easy, don't they? We want something from God, so we ask. We hurt, we're in pain, so we cry out. We're frustrated, so we vent to God, and then we get stuff. We're, we're blessed, and so we thank God. Those are perfectly wonderful prayers, and God says we can and should pray about all things. Prayer comes easy. It comes even naturally for Christians. So often we say our prayers come from our hearts, right? But think for a moment about your heart. Naturally, what do we know about our hearts? That they don't want the things that God wants. That our hearts aren't automatically aligned with God's will, but our hearts are in fact bent inward on us. 
They're turned in on what our selfish pride desires. And so is it wrong to pray for things we want, things we need, or just to vent to our God? No, but for a moment, ask yourself, can those prayers become selfish and in that way sinful? The truth is we need help focusing our prayers on the things that God wants us to pray for. And that is why it's so remarkable that we can pray the prayer that Jesus' disciples prayed with him. They can pray the prayer that said, Lord, teach us to pray. I'm skipping ahead too far. We can say, Lord, teach us how to pray. Because like them, we don't know how to pray. We don't know how to pray focused prayers that are about things that our Lord wants all the time. I challenge you to do this. Go back and and look at the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11 or listen and think about it as we pray it later today in our worship service. What are the things that the Lord himself taught us to pray for? They're the matters of his heart. They're the whole breadth of God's will. That God's kingdom matters and it and it should come. That we have sins and we need forgiveness and other people sin against us and, and we need to share that. That we live in a spiritual war and we don't want to be led into temptations and, and battles we can't handle, but we need God. We need the Holy Spirit to strengthen us in that. This is what God's will is. And, and when his disciples said, Lord, what should we pray for? This is it. He teaches them to pray for things, not that, that we want, for the things that he wants for us. Can I teach you perhaps the single biggest change or revelatory thing about prayers that someone has taught me? It's the idea that we don't have to come up with the words to pray. I learned that embarrassingly late in my life that we don't have to come up with the words to pray. You think about that, that's how Christian culture so often makes it to seem, that we have to conjure up these these beautiful prayers to our God. And and don't we, we kind of extol people and really like put people up on a pedestal who can say really, really flowery and fancy prayers? But we don't have to come up with the words to pray. That's not how our God taught us to pray. Our God taught us to pray by simply reciting the words that He's already given us. Let me say that again. God taught us to pray simply by reciting the words that he's already given us. We don't have to make up our prayers to God, but in fact, he's given us the things to pray for that we already want. And we can do that by just opening up his word and and speaking those back to him. Can we just use an example of it from our other scripture reading this morning? We read 1 Timothy chapter 2. Can I show you how we can just pray this back to God? Can we pray this prayer together right now in worship? God's word back to him in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Would you join me? We'll say this. God our Savior, we come before your throne with hope and joy knowing that you want everyone to be saved and that you want everyone to know your truth. We praise you, Lord, that we can step before your throne and pray to you. And it's because of Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for us that we can even come before you and make these requests. And so we do. We pray, Lord, that you use us. You use us to share the knowledge of your truth to everyone so that all people might be saved. We thank you for the gift of prayer and we thank you for the gift of sharing this good news with others. Amen. That's simply what God wants us to pray because that is what God has showed us about his will in Scripture. Here's our first takeaway from the first episode. It's that we don't need to make up the things to pray for. What are focused prayers? Well, focused prayers pray for what God wants for us and not what we want from him. We continue on with the second thing that God teaches us about focused prayers, and that's, that's how we pray. Genesis chapter 18. 
Abraham continues talking to God and he, and he speaks again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I'm nothing but dust and ashes, what if the number of the righteous is five less than 50? Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five people? If I find 45 there, God said, I will not destroy it. Once again, Abraham spoke to him, what if only 40 are found there? God said, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Here's our second lesson from the second episode. How do we pray? Focused prayers are prayed persistently, they're prayed confidently, and in true humility. Those are focused prayers. They are prayed with persistence, they are prayed with confidence, and also humility. Can I go back to our gospel lesson? Think about this. Jesus teaches his disciples how to pray the Lord's Prayer. And then he doesn't just stop there, but what does he do? He gives them an illustration. He gives them a story to give them an example of how he wants them to pray the Lord's Prayer. Did you catch it? It doesn't really make too much sense for us because we don't often have people coming to ask for three loaves of bread in the middle of the night. But he gave the story of a friend who goes to another friend and in the middle of the night begs him again and again to give him bread, even though he said, dude, I'm already in bed. My door's already locked. What can you, what can you and I compare this to? Well, it's the coworker who emails you again and again while you're on vacation or on your day off and asks you again and again to give you that document. Or maybe it's the family member who, who calls you and then calls you, and then calls you again and again just to say, hey, can you get more bananas from the store? And you think, oh my goodness, it's an emergency. But they're persistent, and so they get through to you. Or maybe, or maybe it's the toddler who stands there before his parent and says, mommy, 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 and again and again shouts out to his mom, and when she finally turns to him and says, what, what do you want? He says, oh, I just wanted to say hi. That's the example that Jesus gives. And it's not just of the persistence. He uses a word. He says it's shameless audacity that is the res reason prayers are heard. It's not just because you love your, your coworker or your family member or your child that you respond to them. But why? It's because of their shameless audacity coming again and again that you finally turn and answer them. And God said, that's how I want you to pray. I want you to pray the things that I want for you, not just what you want from me. I want you to pray the things that are aligned with my will with shameless audacity. I want you to be persistent. I want you to come again and again like a toddler before their parent and say, Daddy, 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 please. That's how your Lord wants you to pray. But here's the beautiful part. It's with confidence. The persistence is with confidence because we're not just asking from bananas or milk from the store or a silly document for work or just to say hi. No, it's because we're standing in the throne room of God's grace and we're appealing before his very throne for grace and mercy. Grace and mercy, by the way, that your God has already promised that he wants to give you, that he desires to give you, that he wants nothing more than for you and the whole world to have. So come with confidence. Come with persistence, come with confidence. But again, let's look at Abraham. He prays with true humility. He says, Lord, now that I have been so bold to speak to you, it's kind of self-aggrandizing, it sounds like. But he says, Lord, now that, now that I've even, even tried this, now that I've even, even ventured to speak to you, knowing I'm nothing but dust and ashes, hear my prayer. It's remembering that we can pray to God. It's remembering that we have prayer as a gift to God. But the second thing we learn is how to pray. It's with persistence and complete confidence and yet true humility. Here's the third thing. It's who do we pray to? Who do we pray our focused prayers to? And but now you're thinking, Matt, why is this even a point in the sermon? <laughs> we know who we pray to. We pray to Jesus. We pray to God. We pray to the Holy Spirit, our triune God. Why is this even, even a point? Well, note this, that focused prayers pray to a personal, patient, and our paternal God. Let's unpack that, the way Abraham draws it out. 
in his focus prayer in Genesis chapter 18. Then Abraham said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak. What if only 30 can be found there? He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Abraham said, Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, what if only 20 can be found there? God said, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak just once more. What if only 10 can be found there? He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. When the Lord had finished speaking with Abraham, he left, and Abraham returned home. This is God's word. Who do we pray to? When you watch an episode like this from the docu-series on Abraham, it can be really easy to focus on Abraham and think, wow, this guy is awesome. This guy prays perfect focused prayers, prayers that are not selfishly aligned with his will, but are totally aligned with God's will. Wow, I I don't even pray, much less do I pray like that. It can be really easy to look at Abraham and go, that is so impressive how he prayed persistently, yet confidently, and also humbly. When, When I pray, I'm never like that. It can be really easy to focus on Abraham, but God put this in here so that we focus on him and his response to Abraham's prayer and your prayers. You have a God who listens to your prayers, who focuses on your prayers, and does so in a personal way. What does God do again in the face of the most egregious sin? He comes to us. He comes to you. Your prayers are not some ethereal, pious throwing of words into the air and hope that God hears them. God, if you're really up there, please hear me. No, you pray to a personal God whom you stand before. You stand before him as though you were already but not yet in heaven, and there he hears you. This is not a God who is unfamiliar with what you go through, but this is a God who, when he sees sin, makes a habit of diving into sin and being there so that you remember your standing always, that you are standing always before him. This is your God. He is a personal God and he is a patient God. He is a God who wants you to treat him like a father. He wants you to come before him and email him on even his days off. He wants you to come again and again and say, daddy, 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 please, because he cares that much and he's never like maybe a worldly parent going to get impatient or frustrated with you, but always hear you. And finally, he's a paternal or a caring God. Look at what Luke 11 says about how we should pray. This is, again, Jesus giving an example of how we should pray to him. He asks the question, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? This is how your Father wants you to picture him. As a Father who doesn't just give the bare minimum, but who gives the maximum of all his gifts, gives the Holy Spirit to you when you ask, when you seek, when you knock, you will always find that God has good gifts for you, greater gifts than you could even imagine. That's what happened here. It's it's easy to look at the ending of this story, to see sin at its worst, to see sin destroyed, To even look at both episodes and say, God, you you listened to Abraham's prayer, but it seems like you didn't even hear him. You still destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, completely wiped off all the people, all the plants. But did you note that God answered this prayer and and gave him something even greater than, than Abraham, the bold, persistent prayer could even think of? God did something even greater. He didn't didn't just save 10 people. No, God doubled down on his own grace. And he saved only three that were there. 
How does episode two end? Well, it doesn't end with this. It ends with Abraham back standing before the Lord. And here's what it says. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and returned to the place where he stood before the Lord. He looked down and he saw Sodom and Gomorrah toward all the land of the plain, and he saw dense smoke rising from the land like smoke from a furnace. So when God destroyed the cities of the plain, he remembered Abraham and he brought Lot out of the catastrophe that overthrew the cities where Lot had lived. This is God's word. What was it? Was it the, was it the foreordained holy will of God that, that saved Lot and his children? Or was it the prayer of Abraham, the faithful prayer of Abraham that prayed according to God's will, that prayed not according to his, but his will, what he wants for us, that prayed persistently, humbly, and confidently, that prayed in such a way that looked to God as our, as our father? Is that what saved Lot? Or is it God already had this planned? Well, the answer is yes. The answer is yes, because that is the God that that we have. People often say, if you can name it, you can claim it. The truth is far greater than that false idea. The truth is that even when you can't name it, even when you don't know what to pray to your God about, that you have a God who interprets the groans and the prayers, whether they're focused or totally lack focus on our behalf, and brings them before the throne of God's grace and gives us better things than we could even ask or imagine. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.